Thank you so much for watching my show, William Wallace for America. With me today in this interview is Daniel Erspommer of the Pelican Institute for Public Policy. Daniel, thank you so much for coming on there. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I got to tell you, Pelican Institute's got a special place in my heart. You know, uh, I think that you guys do a lot of really good things. And uh, what I really like about it is that if you're fighting for freedom and liberty overall, right. you know, and, uh, and, and, so, and sometimes the values, you know, will, will, will shift in some ways, but they always seem to shift towards freedom. And, and we have to protect everybody's freedom. Yeah, that's right. You know, we, we talk about our mission in terms of human flourishing. So success for the Pelican Institute is when everybody in Louisiana, and you know, ultimately everybody yeah. in the country, right? right. But you're working on your work in Louisiana. We're, we're yeah. here. Everyone has the opportunity to flourish, right? It's it's the the key premise of the American experiment. It's it is the American dream, and you know what happens, of course, is government often gets in the way That's of, right. of flourishing, whether it's bad tax policy or bad education policy or overreaching things we've talked about before, yeah. like occupational licensure, all of this stuff. So what we want, a perfect vision of the world, is where everyone has the opportunity to flourish. And yeah. I think a lot of people could agree with that. And, and, and from what I understand, when I did an interview a while back, you know, the Pelican Institute not only has those beliefs, but you all will, will uh, help people in lawsuits or in situations where their freedoms are under attack and they're not doing well. That's right. You know, we, we work a lot on persuading people that freedom and free enterprise is in their best interest. And right. that leads to a change in law, right? Yeah. We can move people's beliefs on things. We can change law. But, you know, sometimes the government <laughs> is just intractable and we got to sue them. So exactly. we, uh, we have the Pelican Center for Justice, um, our great attorneys, James Baer and Sarah Harbison, uh, are fighting every day for on behalf of our clients who have been wronged by the government, who've been wronged by uh, policies that uh, deserve justice. And um, so as uh, so we do that, we also train leaders. We have the Pelican Leadership Academy. I love this, yeah. Um, so we're looking at you know who is the next generation of leaders who's who's going to be in the legislature or in, uh, in, in the governor's mansion. Involved or, in, an, in a group, maybe. That's right. So um, we're in our fourth year of the Pelican Leadership Academy. It's uh, the uh, alumni are already doing great yeah. things. We have about a dozen people running for office uh, this cycle alone who are graduates of the academy. So lots of exciting things going on. Yeah. Well, now, do you guys mainly focus on individuals? I know when we think of freedom, we think of individual freedom. But do you all mainly focus on individuals, or do you all help any kind of businesses or groups that, that have a freedom issue? Yeah, so mostly individuals, but uh, but certainly we have represented uh, companies before. In fact, um, our our challenge, or I should say, Brandon Trostclair, uh, his challenge against uh, the OSHA vaccine mandate uh, was our client was his company, uh, BST Holdings. Right. Name of it. So. Uh, certainly, you know we we care about liberty and individual uh, individual rights and free enterprise and you know frankly ir irrelevant whether it's an individual or a, an organization or company. So uh, we want to we want to really stand up for people's rights and and push back against big government. But you know you we, you talk about that, but, but the reality is even though you represented his business, you really represented the rights and freedoms of about 500 people that work for him, correct? That, that's exactly right. And, you know, Brandon will be the first to tell you the reason he stepped forward. And look, it, it takes a lot of gumption to, to put your name on a lawsuit right. and sue the government. I mean, and he I, had, I think the president was in was on that. That's right. was listed on that. Joe Biden was that, listed on that. That's right. We, One Brandon suing another Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Brandon versus Biden. That's yeah, right. Like to think of it. So, um, yeah, it takes a big deal, but he'll be the first to tell you he did it because he wanted to stand up for his his workers, his teammates, his colleagues, and and frankly for millions of other Americans um, who. And, and look, we've talked about this. It wasn't pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine, but the fact of the matter is, it's inappropriate for the government, and particularly by uh, administrative executive action, exactly. to just declare this to be so. Well, it's, it's like I said, it goes back to it's an encroachment on freedom. That's right. You know, government should never be mandating anything, you know, because we can't ask government to mandate things for us. It should never be mandating anything. And also to the point that I think with, with what I'm, I'm trying to bring out more and more in my interviews and stuff is that our Constitution is being circumvented by the bureaucracies and the, and the, and the agencies and the 
you know, all the different bureaucratic you know, forms of government, yeah. and it's being done in a way that they are creating rules and regulations, you know, without having an answer to Congress, which has to answer to our Constitution. They're doing these regulations in the agencies, and even some of the elected officials in the higher up offices are being able to give them directives to create these this legislation that's infringing our freedoms and circumventing the Constitution at the same time. And some of the things that you guys are doing is shining a light on that. You're absolutely right. You know, this is perhaps the biggest threat to our constitutional republic. Um, it, you know, the, you think about the founders, right? And, and if you read those documents and study the founding of the country, they were terrified of a central government taking too much power. Exactly. Right? They believed in this confederation of states that would come together as a republic and, and band together, right? Um, but that the individual rights was at the center of, of what they cared about and and that these states would have have autonomy to, to act and, and push back against a, a central federal government. And we just see it, and frankly, it's not a Republican or a Democrat issue. Right. This, this administration seems to be particularly right. um, aggressive in this overreach, but this is being done by, by all parties. It's, it's a function of government overreaching its constitutional bounds. Thankfully, thankfully we have some, some judges who are willing to step forward right. and say, no, we believe in the Constitution. Our job is we, we take an oath to uphold the Constitution. So our, uh, here our Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals um, is, has been exceptional uh, at, at pushing back against uh, federal government overreach, and, and so far the United States Supreme Court has done the same. So we're gonna keep giving them opportunities to, uh, to do that, and, and I'm just proud to be representing uh, clients who are willing to step up and fight for their rights and the rights of others. And that's one aspect, we're gonna talk about the other aspect here in just a second, but you know our founding fathers created you did not want a central government controlling our lives, and our central government may not have may not be blocking us from the Constitution, but there, since that, that government is surrounding itself with a, bureau, with a very thick level of bureaucratic agencies that's keeping us from that Constitution. No, no question about it. And I'll mention too, this, this isn't just a problem at the federal level. You know, we see this right but here. But you're higher up than federal level. <laughs> <laughs> we, we see it right here in Louisiana. You know, let's, okay. Let's take these. Uh, and we're going to talk about the things you're working on. We here. are, but I think this this is is related. Here's these these coastal lawsuits, right? So this is uh, for those who may not be familiar. The uh, starting back about a decade ago now, a handful of, of plaintiffs' attorneys went around to local governments and they encouraged. Uh, these uh, local parishes to, to file lawsuits against oil and gas companies claiming that their activities had, had caused coastal erosion, basically. Well, several of those parishes chose not to. Their elected officials said, we're not going to enter the lawsuit. We don't believe uh, that this is, that they violated their permits or they did anything wrong. Um, and the state, the governor, and the Department of Natural Resources said, oh, we don't care. We're going to sue on your behalf. Uh, Wait. So... So that these agencies that didn't want to sue, these, it, that's right. These yeah. parishes, local yeah, parishes, parishes here, right? Yeah, um, said we're not. There's a, there's a three or four of them said we're not going to sue, and the and the state said no, you are, and we're going to appoint a special counsel for your parish, and we'll sue on your behalf. So this is almost like the federal government, very much getting the states involved, or, or, or attaching the states to either lawsuits or attaching or, or or being able to hold them accountable via federal money and right. dollars, and it's kind of the state doing this to the parishes. That's right. It's it's the state modeling the very worst of the behavior of, <laughs> of our federal <laughs> government. Um, these are these are big problems, and, and so, you know, I know we'll talk about the legislature and some of some of what's coming up, but but these are big issues that sometimes only courts of law, only judges can, can ultimately right. You know, these are yeah. wrongs that only they can right. Um, so we're going to keep pushing on all fronts to make sure, and, and look, we're, uh, we're, uh, First Amendment absolutist. We believe in the Constitution. Uh, we believe in the rights of speech and association, and uh, and the Tenth Amendment too. That said, you know, that the duties yeah, not yeah, delegated, exactly, 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 right. rights not delegated to the federal government belong to the state. So um, we're going to keep fighting for the Constitution uh, alongside you and. I love this. I absolutely. Let's talk about some of the things you're fighting on in Louisiana. Yeah. Now, for my national listeners, they might go, "Well, how does that affect us at an, on a national level?" But there's a lot of legislation that you guys are working on here in Louisiana that we're seeing replicas of all over the country. That's right. And, and, you're, and we're fighting these battles here and winning these battles here with other states 
around the country fight those same battles when it gets to them, or if they've won or lost them, we're just carrying the battle, carrying that torch on right now. That's right. And I'll make one other argument about why someone elsewhere should should care about what's happening in Louisiana. Yeah. Um, and and this, you know, I, I speak to to your your viewers, but also to our our leaders here, which is Louisiana should be the economic powerhouse of the country. Um, you know, if you look, we have five of the top 15 ports in the country, the most active natural gas sector, some of the most oil refineries of any state in the country. We have water and land and sporting, hunting, fishing, festivals. We have the mouth of the Mississippi River, for goodness sake. Yeah. The policies of Louisiana impact not just the country, but the world. Right. A thriving Louisiana energy sector means cheaper gasoline and cheaper energy prices for Americans all over the country, frankly, for the world, especially we saw uh, just recently OPEC now coming, uh, cutting supply once again. Oh, really? Um, just, just this week, um, several members of OPEC said they'll be cutting supply. Louisiana can solve much of that problem. Um, the, the goods and services that come up the Mississippi River that all Americans buy, whether it's grain or imports, the, 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 the agriculture we're exporting, um, if it's more expensive, if it's not thriving here in Louisiana, it makes it more expensive and harder for everybody else to flourish. So, um, so we are talking about Louisiana. Exactly. Uh, and and you're but how it affects right. the rest of the country. Um, you're absolutely right that we're seeing trends here that other states are seeing, but also our success means if if we can really make this the most prosperous, most opportunity filled state in the country, the impact on the rest of the country really is um, outsized, even more so than than many other states. It's amazing how energy independence and all the different all the different um, resources we have here in Louisiana are a key to the rest of the country. Yeah. However, Louisiana keeps finishing last in all the rankings. You know, we keep finishing you know dead last in so much, right. and now of the ten most um, violent cities in America, Louisiana's now got three of them. You know, you can't get through. You, you can't go to the East or the West, yeah. you know, or the North without going through one of these major cities of crime, right. you know, uh, but and, but Pelican Institute is working on some key things. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about some of the legislation that you, that Pelican sure. Institute is working on. Well, well, let's start with education because okay. I think, um, you know, <laughs> whether it's, it's crime or poverty or workforce or any of these issues, education really is, is the, the linchpin to success. And, and you're right, unfortunately, you know, we've ended up on the bottom of, of every good list right. for a long time. This is not right. new. Um, and even as we've made some improvements in student outcomes in the last decade or so, everybody else is moving faster. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a few things, right, just to reset, right? The first thing is during, I have four kids. Um, you know, during the, the lockdowns, one of the things that was just in stark relief was just how differently all of my kids engage with their schoolwork, engage right. in learning. They all came in the same household with the same parents and you know one studying the earphones on, the other one's perfect quiet in the closet, That's right. you know. Some we had to come kick you know bring <laughs> kicking and screaming to their schoolwork. Some were you know right, right, right into the desk. That's right. Oh I'm sure you didn't handcuff them. Not, right. Right. <laughs> Not that we'll admit no. Yeah right. <laughs> Um, so, you know, education, what we just, this is something we've known for a long time, but every parent in America knows it now, is school does not have to mean walking into a government building at 8 o'clock in the morning and leaving a government building at 3. And as we look around the, the country and the world, we see we can deliver quality education and help kids prepare for college or career or military or whatever comes next mm -hmm. in just myriad different ways, whether it's homeschool, private school, micropod, co-ops, public charter schools, magnet schools, traditional public schools, you name it. Exactly. There's all of these options. And yet, and yet, here in Louisiana and in too many states, we continue to try to deliver education in a one-size-fits-all box, and every kid goes to their zone public school, and that's just the way it is. Well, I'm a believer in public education. I believe we've made a commitment, and it's critical mm, absolutely. Keep that, it, yeah. that we have an educated voter base, an educated workforce, an educated citizenry, and it's, I am absolutely convinced the only way we're going to save public education in Louisiana is by disrupting it and by providing choice to every kid. I, you know, this is the, the critique when we talk about this. Um, you know, our, our particular solution that we recommend is a universal education savings account or education scholarship account. We call it different things. The idea is that the money the state is spending on our kids follows the child 
to the school or educational opportunity of their choice. What, what we hear from, from people who are, are trying to, to stop this, to protect the status quo, oh, you're trying to ruin public education. My argument back is it's actually just the opposite. If we have any hope of saving public education, if we want kids to succeed, if we want to maintain our commitment to public education, this is the only pathway to get there, is by disrupting the system that's been in place since the 1600s uh, in, in the United States. Well, now you told an interesting story, I'm interrupt you for one second, yeah. on, on how public education got started. That's right. And does that, and, and you want to share that yeah. before, before we continue? So this is something I learned from Rick Hess at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, he's got some great stuff if, if you're looking for, for some interesting education content. Um, the first public education law in America was passed in, uh, in Massachusetts, and the motivation for it was to prevent young women from becoming witches. Uh, <laughs> was, you know, they were concerned that, that idle hands were out there and the, yeah. the devil's playground, and, and uh, of course this was during you know, Salem witch trials and everything else, and, um, and there was a real concern in communities that, that young women would, would lose their, their way, their moral way, and, and become witches, and that was the first compulsory public education law in America. Uh, and basically we deliver education the same way today, yeah. roughly, that we did then, it's the same model. Um, and it just, it doesn't work. And we see it by, you know, just, just, just now, right? We look at the numbers and, and even just since the pandemic, we've seen a drop in enrollment. Right. And yet we continue to put more and more I mean, money Jefferson into the Parish system. Jefferson Parish is closing a bunch of schools. That's right. Here, very They're like, what, like seven or eight schools? Or seven or eight or was it 11? I, I, I don't remember the final number, yeah. but some, something in that right. range. Yeah, this is a, this, so, so right. again, I exactly. say, yeah. if we're going to save public education, we that's disrupt the it. way to do it. Um, and what we know is parents know best what is a good fit for their kids. Right. The idea that, that a government will know better than a parent is just absolutely crazy. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't accept that in any other right. you know, place in our world. So, uh, so what we know, and here's, here's the other thing, right? On a, on a moral sense, this is the right thing to do, um, but the data bear it out as well. We look at, at states that have had uh, education freedom uh, or school choice in their, in their states. Florida has the longest history of this. Um, and what do we see when we give parents the choice? Two things happen that are phenomenal. The first is that would make the most sense, right? The kids whose parents exercise that choice and take them to a different educational opportunity, their outcomes improve, right? That would make sense, right? You're, you're exercising a choice. Well, here's the thing that's amazing. Not only do those kids have better educational outcomes, but the kids who stay in the traditional public schools also have better outcomes. How's this? Well, I would... What's, uh, what's the hypothesis behind that? My hypothesis is, is the basis behind a lot of things we believe, which is competition makes things better, right? When, when you have to compete, when you're not just a monopolistic system, everybody improves. The, the, the tide rises for everyone. Yeah. And, by the way, now these traditional public schools can specialize a little bit. They can really deliver the best version of their education. There's some amazing teachers that work in, and administrators too, working really hard, you know, to, 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 to try to make kids fit in the system. You know, it's, it's interesting is when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you, as we delve into this, and what comes to my mind is, you know, if you have lots of opportunities, a pod, a charter school, a public school, a private school, you know, homeschool, groups, whatever, they get together, you may end up with like teachers, you know, that teach regular school, you know, after hours, have starting businesses to teach children right. privately, and it's almost like if, if, when you start divvying up, I think that's a, a, a bit of wrong word, but when children are choosing and they're not all funneled into one building, and, there's, and, 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 they're, and the children are spread amongst where they're best, best suited yeah. to learn, not only competition, but you get more one-on-one -on -one teaching right. for the child instead of them being in a classroom of 30, 35 kids where they don't get the attention nope. that they may need. And you know, the other part of this that people don't talk about as much, but is, is just as real, is this, this benefits teachers too. Now teachers, you know, think about if you're, if you're gonna go be an engineer somewhere, right? You have, I don't know how many, hundreds of different yeah. companies who are hiring engineers. And you can choose, and one may have a better compensation, you know, salary, but one may have better benefits. One may give you flexibility during the day. One may be more traditional and structured. 
right? Competition benefits not only the customer, the kids, mm -hmm. and the parents, but this benefits the teachers and administrators, too, who now also will have different entities, different schooling options competing for the very best talent. This is a good thing for everybody. We talk about how to increase teacher pay, and look, I'm one who believes good teachers should be paid not just a little more, but a lot more. Okay. Um, but, but that doesn't mean everybody gets paid a lot more. That means we pay good teachers a lot more, and we help them mentor other teachers and build that pipeline. You know, they're, they're just, there are ways to do this system really well, and it, look, it's breaking into people's little fiefdoms, and it's, it's breaking up the status quo. Right, so yeah, there you go. Now you talk, now you get into the, where, where's the money That's coming right. from, right? That's right. But we're spending just the state, setting aside the local governments, we're spending $4 billion a year on a public education system in Louisiana. Wait, and in Louisiana, it's $4 billion? $4 billion. And not only that, but in addition to that, we've got another $4 billion in federal funds that have flown in the last year. I was going to say, how much? It's $8 billion, including federal funds, which is how the federal government gets to tie in their policies, rules, right. procedures, and what we teach our children, because they go, you want that four billion to match your four billion? You got to teach these standards, and the federal government is not as in tune with our local children as parents and the local schools are. So, to your yep. point, when you break up the system and rearrange it based on the response of children and how it's being taught, yep. it's being done more efficiently, and we don't need that federal money. That's right. You know. <laughs> We've been talking about this a lot, this idea of federal money coming in. It's education, it's health care, it's everything. Uh, Louisiana has is one of the most dependent states on federal dollars of any state in the country. And, you know, what happens... The, here's so the bottom of the list, most dependent. That's, hmm, imagine that. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. So, so here's the problem, right? So our congressional delegation, great congressional delegation, right? right? Great people, they're Absolutely. out up there working Absolutely. hard for us. But, and they mean really well, I'm not criticizing them, but what happens is the incentives are such that they go up to Washington and secure some federal grant. They issue a press release and have a press conference that says, we brought home the bacon. We've got a billion dollars more. For and, your education. And what do we do? Yay! Yeah, that was a great one. We've, we've aligned the incentives to where their, their job is to bring home money. Well, you know, I always say there's no federal money tree. This is not, these are our tax dollars. Not. Too. I know, it's, it's hard, to, hard <laughs> to imagine. I mean, the, you know. The truth is, it's not even our tax dollars. These are the tax dollars of our grandkids and great grandkids oh, I, at yeah. this point yeah. in, in the process. We've borrowed so much money. Um, that, that comes to an end at some point, yeah. too. And, and then where are we, right? We're left right. holding the bag on Medicaid expansion that's costing billions of dollars and, and leaving the most needy people behind. Uh, we're talking about education spending that's that's just, you know, we looked at some of how this extra $4 billion from the feds has been right. spent. Well, we found a few things. It's fascinating. One, that uh, uh, one school district uh, expanded the press box in their football stadium uh, using these COVID relief dollars. Now, I will give them credit. They were clever in their <laughs> They were clever about it. I got they, it. They said that they had to expand the press box for a million dollars, by the way, um, to allow for more social distancing at their high school football game press coverage. Now, um, I don't know. I, high school football is important. Yeah. I don't know that there's such a big throng of press. Yeah, high school and football a million dollar. Stadium, yeah, right? and you need to do a million dollar right. So you know these these are dollars that are supposed to be helping kids get caught up from learning loss and the pandemic. Maybe making some changes to schools to allow for COVID yeah. mitigation, that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of things that legitimately you could spend exactly. this money on. Exactly right. Um, meanwhile, our kids are still behind. They were behind to begin with. Now they're even further behind. Um, this is money that could go to tutors. That could go to increase curriculum opportunities for course choice for all sorts of things. You know, when we see these kinds of decisions being made, you just know this this is this is evidence one why we need disruption in our system. We know your children are fail in school, but we gotta do stadium it's over great, here, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and look, it's, I love football as much as I guy. Exactly. You know, I mean, I'm watching how much money we waste on you know, and I'm all about sports. I get it, but yeah. you know, we want you know anyway. We know. So, what legislation? Yeah. What bills are you guys working on that have to do with education in the Louisiana legislature? So, a few. I'll point out first. Uh, the chairman of the education committee, Lance Harris, uh, has filed a bill uh, that would 
be a universal education savings account. So this is similar in nature. Now we've, we've talked about a, a wave across the country. We've seen Arizona, West Virginia, Utah, Iowa, and now Arkansas just recently, um, and, and a, a few other states, Florida uh, now doing this as well, where they've passed this idea that every child, every family should have access to these dollars to follow the child. Uh, so the chairman has, has filed that bill. Um, you may recall last year uh, there were four sort of targeted bills that would allow different student populations uh, to access those dollars. Two of them passed the legislature and the governor vetoed both of them. So uh, we will see, we will <laughs> see what happens uh, this year, but this will certainly be a big debate and the legislature will also, I suspect, assuming it does not make it all the way through this year, uh, which we're going to fight hard to, to try to get it uh, to do so. Lots of parents will be making their voices heard too. But if it doesn't, you can rest assured this will be a big debate uh, in the gubernatorial race that comes this fall. Uh, we had most of those uh, candidates on our stage at the Solution Summit uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, and every one of them talked about uh, their commitment to allowing dollars to follow the child. So uh, to that point, so basically the, 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 the parents will not have a savings account at a bank that they can go withdraw money from, it basically would be, you know, here's here's what you what you, what's in your account and, and you can take that account to a private school and say, okay, you guys have to deduct from this. That's right. You know, now I it just something that comes to my mind. Yeah. You know, a parents can have education savings accounts of their own mm -hmm. for saving money for children to go to college. Yep. You know, I wonder if there's some way to merge the two. Yeah. You know, to where let's say a parent decides, I'm going to take all my tax dollars, I'm going to homeschool my child, so I'm going to build up this bank here of 5000 or $3,000 a year, whatever it costs, and I'm going to add to that a little bit of my own little savings. Yep. And so when my child goes to college, I've got their college paid for because I've saved all that money and just rolled it right. forward. Is that is that a lot of thinking with this? Yeah, absolutely. Look, this is it, it works kind of like a health savings account in that you know you you've got access to these dollars and there are some restrictions, right? They've got to be used for uh, approved education expenses. So, but but that's a pretty broad category. Think about uh, all the things that that your traditional public school spends money on, right? right. That that includes, by the way, field trips and musical instruction and sports and you know so so there's a lot of, of flexibility again parents know best what's for their kid right but but this could mean some mix of a, a homeschool co-op and a tutor this could mean but, but the thing about this is is not as it put parents in control of their children's education it puts people in right. control of their tax dollars that's right and that might be why there's so many government politicians having pushback because they don't want the people to be in charge of the money. You're just the little people. That's right. We're the people that you will let to waste your money and spend yep. it the wrong way. Well, that's it. That, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's be clear. The biggest opponents to this of the Capitol um, are the Louisiana School Boards Association, the Louisiana Superintendents mm. Association, and the teachers' unions. Those are the institutionally the three groups who are loudest in their opposition. Um, and, you know, we've just had this wave of school board elections. I encourage... Uh, new school board members to ask questions of their yeah. school board association. Why are you opposing right. uh, the the opportunity for me as a parent or me as a school board to, to provide flexibility uh, to our to our families in our local districts? You know, these are questions that that need to be asked. And and frankly, you know, and I, I'm not about throwing bombs at people or whatever, but but these are tax dollars being used to pay dues to these organizations, uh, and then those organizations are using those tax dollars to lobby against parents and taxpayers and people like you and me at the Capitol who, who do this on yeah. our own private dime with uh, either our own time or fundraising exactly. or everything right. else um, and, and stand up for, you know, in our case, tens of thousands of Louisianans across the so state. So instead of following the narrative that's being put out there, that this is to destroy public education and to destroy education in America, follow the results that's right. of the states who've done this where it succeeded and if we can show, hey, the school board and everything, you know, they, they, they have everything to lose. That's right. Because less money to there means less people they can hire, which means less retirement, which means less, 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 less. However, if we can show that the competition raises all the shifts, then the fewer teachers that they may have might be able to make more money sure. and have better performance to show for their career.
Well, and I'll add to this, right? So as they're currently designed, the local dollars stay in the local school district. So this is just moving state dollars. So actually, assuming some kids will leave and take those education savings accounts dollars to a, a different opportunity outside of their traditional public school, uh, that means the school district will actually serve fewer kids with the same amount of money uh, from their local taxpayers. So they actually end up with, with more dollars per kid because there are fewer kids, the same amount of local dollars. Um, and, and, and again, you start to look at what are, what are the outcomes of this? Yeah. And how, how, you know, so this is another reason I'll, I'll, I'll move to a, another bill that we care a lot about. Representative Rick Edmonds has brought this bill a couple of times. It's been vetoed by the governor at least once. Um, that would provide transparency to local school boards on how they're spending our tax dollars. Now, what's wrong with transparency? <laughs> it's my belief that the very least government can do is tell us how they're spending our money, right? This is, this is baseline before you do anything else. Yeah, next thing you do, you're asking the federal government to publish the money and publish the budget. <laughs> Crazy. Right. Crazy. We've already asked the state to do this, right? This is on Louisiana checkbook. Now, they haven't quite finished loading everything up there. Yeah. That's a conversation yeah. for a different day. But uh, this is, I believe, every taxpayer dollar should have transparency about how to be. To the pen. That's right. It's not that much to ask. And what they'll tell you, I've heard this from some system leaders, well, we put our budgets online. That's great. Yeah. That's great. First of all, I was handed one. It's a it's a binder about this yeah. thing, right? And you're and it's a budget. It's not the checkbook level of how you're spending right. money, right? Those are different things. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. And look, if you have nothing to hide, why do you care? And remember that budget to buy uh, school supplies, and it's November, December, or, or the end of the school year, and they realize, oh no. It's the end of the budget year, and we haven't spent all that money yet. You know, the budget just shows, hey, hundred thousand dollars or whatever for this, for that, right. for that. But the checkbook shows, oh, they bought twenty reams of paper. You know, in yep. addition to the other twenty reams they had from last year, or you know, they've got all these different, you know. And look, I suspect when we get this transparency, the vast majority of spending is going to be. We're going to look at that and go, yep, that's exactly right. But sunlight is a great disinfectant. Oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. And when you know people are looking... It kills COVID, too, by the way. It does, <laughs> Vitamin D, maybe. It, when you know people are looking, you behave differently, right? Right. Um, it's why it's important. I encourage everyone watching, show up to your local school board meeting. Show up to your city council meeting. Even if you're just going to sit there and take notes. It just people when they see more people watching, right. they get things happen differently. And it's, it's often well-intended people. You know, you just, it, the system incentivizes bad behavior in right. many ways. And so the more transparency, the more sunlight, the better. And, and I think Representative Edmonds' bill does a great job of making this user-friendly. They're using an existing program that's in the Treasury, uh, the, the State tre Treasurer's Office already, that is platform agnostic. So it, whatever system you're using, QuickBooks, you're using, whatever you're using, no problem. This system, it requires a click of a button upload. Um, it does. It is paid for by the state. It does not require additional investment uh, from local. This is what they try to say. Well, it costs too much money. I'm sorry. First of all, again, principle number yeah. one: the least you can do is show me how you're spending my money. The money. That's principle one. And the, the, and the money you spent on that press box at that football stadium huh. could have paid for that site. Sure. <laughs> so uh, there's just no excuse not to support this bill. And and so Representative Edmonds. Uh, we'll champion this again, and, and we'll see we'll see what so happens. That's two bills you're working on. What are some other? That's ones? right. Um, in the education, how many you do, you know, how, do you know offhand how many you're going to be working on? Total? Well, you know, there's still some bills being filed. Right. Um, oh, yeah. So we'll, there's we'll, only we'll 500 have been filled. That's up right. That's right. There's still for sure another 500 to go. So what are some of the other ones? So the the other sort of area that there's a few, but the other big issue area for us as we head into this legislative session and of course the election is tax reform. And, you know, uh, uh, the, the sin of Louisiana's tax code really is complexity. Um, you know, I, I, you've heard me say this before, but we have, just in the corporate tax code alone, 432 pages of tax credits, carve-outs, deductions, preferences. How old is the Constitution, of the, of the United States Constitution? How, how, how old? How, how, how old? How old? Oh, yeah. I mean, how, how, how so the, is the U.S. Constitution and its amendments is about 7,500 words. I think 7,592. Okay. Um, the Louisiana Constitution 
uh, in, in total is well over 90,000 words. And the, the part of it just about spending money is, is about 13,000 words. So we've doubled the whole US Constitution almost uh, in just talking about fiscal matters in the state of Louisiana. Um, so this is, you know, it, it's just so complex. The spending, the budget, the, the taxation, right. all of this together. And what that means is as we head into this, this fiscal year, this is incredible. Uh, now this includes federal dollars, so state taxpayer dollars, state, federal dollars are coming in, and we already those are our dollars too. Um, and if you're watching from out of state, those are your dollars. Exactly. Well. Exactly. Um, we're going to have a budget for a little over four and a half million people. We're going to have a fifty billion dollar budget the current fiscal year. That's an absurd amount of money. Fifty billion. Fifty dollars. billion. Wow. And we're we're doing this analysis now. We'll actually have a report pretty soon, uh, giving some transparency to this. So we looked at, okay, what was the, the first budget that was presented? And then, you know, as the, the year went on, we recognized more revenue. The economy was chugging along, okay, despite inflation and everything else, we're collecting more than we planned on uh, in tax revenue. And then more federal dollars came in, all this together. So you start to look and you end up the final appropriated budget and now some surplus is about, this is for, sorry, for last fiscal year, uh, three billion dollars more than the first budget that was approved. So we we decided we could run the state on this one number, exactly. Right? And then because more money came, we spent some of it, we yeah. saved some of it, but three billion dollars yeah. more. So when I talk about tax relief, when I talk about an opportunity, we'll, we'll we'll go through the plan here. But to not not only restructure that so we simplify the tax code, but, but give taxpayers some relief too. I don't want to hear right. that we have a hard time with a few hundred million dollars right. of tax relief when we've got billions more. Well, there's, we a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a surplus now, as you talk, that I've heard what your number, and I've heard it's a billion dollars plus or minus, you know, you know but, but I've heard that next year there's a deficit. Well, <laughs> or they drops, and then the, the, the next year is when the bottom drops out. Well, they <laughs> said that before. Uh, let's remember that when, when Governor John Bell Edwards took office uh, in uh, 2016, the state budget was $28 billion. So he's increased it by $32 billion. So this, and now some of that's federal money. Well, well, $22, right, $22, right, $22 billion. Right. Right. Um, but that's an absurd increase. Um, and, and it's we almost can, double. That's right, and and so don't talk to me about <laughs> about a, a fiscal cliff, right? Yeah, this is a spending problem. This is not a revenue problem. And what happened in the con in in that time is we raised taxes by two billion dollars a year um, in the sales tax, and, and you know this is we have got to get control of spending. So if you look at that, we went from twenty eight billion to fifty billion in seven years, and we lost population in that time, right? So our, our proposal, right, because budget is, is the other side of the coin of, of tax, right? Um, if you can constrain spending and, and prioritize spending, you can provide a simpler, lower tax system. So what we've proposed, and the legislature actually passed this in 2020. Uh, of course, that was COVID year, and it failed on the ballot, in large part because of confusing ballot language. <laughs> right. And at times, we couldn't get out and stump for it. The lawmakers who championed this couldn't get out and rally votes, and you know, yeah. it, was a, it was a challenging time. Uh, but what this bill would have done, this was Representative Bo Boye, uh, would have constrained the growth of state government by a series of measures. What we recommend is look at population and inflation. So if there's inflation, of course government spending should be able to grow to meet that need. And same, if, if the population is growing, the state yeah. should be able to grow with it. Presumably you're bringing in more tax money and right. all of that, right? So this seems like a very reasonable thing. Well, we're, be, we're looking and running those numbers now to say, I mean, I don't have them offhand, but you can imagine it's far less given that we, until the last year or so, had very little inflation uh, and we've had negative population growth uh, here in Louisiana. And so there's no way you get to a $22 billion increase in your state budget. You can so, almost take that $22 billion and you can almost give uh, everybody who's trying to leave the state a little a retention bonus. A retention <laughs> bonus. <laughs> hey, you stay. It's got hundred thousand dollars, and you're going to be still under budget. <laughs> yeah. Here's the deal: with to collect just a little bit less. So by our calculation, maybe something in the ballpark of half a billion dollars, five hundred million dollars less, we could get to a flat personal income tax. 
and then use the constraint of the growth of government, the surplus that will come from that, to buy down that rate. We believe you could phase out the income tax to zero sometime in the next eight to ten years. It kind of depends on what the economy So uh, you say phase it out. Other states that you hear everybody bragging about, well, this state has no income tax, that state has no income tax. They know it comes, you know, <laughs> that's right. Have they, did they phase it out or did they just like cut it cold turkey? So most states that don't have an income tax never did. Um, so Texas, uh, Tennessee is a little bit different story. Uh, Florida, the, the last state to full on repeal an income tax was the 1980s and that was in Alaska. Um, they're a slightly different uh, situation. <laughs> and then Tennessee had no personal income tax except for uh, something they called the Hall tax, which was a tax on dividends and passive income. Okay. Um, and then about six years ago, they began a phase out of that tax. It, it, it was a 6% tax they took off a percentage each year. So um, Tennessee is now completely income tax free, personal income tax free. So most of the states that don't have a, an income tax never had one. What we're seeing in the states that have one and that have made steps in tax relief is they're following something very similar to this. For example, in Arizona, they've lowered their rate to now a flat rate of 2.75%. Uh, in, uh, in Iowa, they've come down from a top rate of what I think was seven. They're now down to one flat rate of just under five and have made a similar plan to use surplus dollars to phase that out over time. We've had a dozen states move from a progressive tax to a flat tax just okay. in the last five years. Um, a flat tax, much fairer, much more predictable, yeah. much more stable, um, just better tax policy overall, and 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 helpful to, to hold the line because you're not just sort of arguing, well, let's raise the tax on those rich people. Right, exactly. You know? exactly. Um, if the rich people have to pay. That's right. So, so we believe even just getting to a flat tax is a big win for the state, right? It it's, it's, uh, makes us more attractive uh, to other places. We believe, that, again, we can get to something around a 3.5% uh, flat tax to start with, which would make us among of states that have an income tax. Now, we're still competing with ones that don't, but of the ones that do, we'll be above, among the lowest um, in the country. Uh, there are, I think, four or five other states that have a lower... But if you're, but if you're doing this as a phase in, uh, you're phasing in, or however you want to say yeah. this, where we go from where we are now to a flat tax, but I think from what I'm hearing you say is it's the stepping stone that's needed to be taken to get it to no income tax. That's right. And so if, we're, if, we're, if, we, if we get it back to the flat tax, at least other states might say, or people that want to move here might say, they're not there yet, but we know they're headed there. That's right. And it's worth it in time for them to invest in our state. That's right. And, and we're going to put, you know, an ideal, you put that into law, right? You don't make them vote on it right. every year. It's, it's automatic that the rates come down as, as their surplus. And, and here's, here's the reality. If you, you could. We've seen plans. Representative Richard Nelson has one. Others have proposed them to move immediately to no income tax. Well, the, the personal income tax brings in about $4 billion a year uh, in Louisiana. So you, you certainly could. That's right. <laughs> Some interesting parallels there. You, you certainly could just eliminate that, but but the reality is, to do that, you're just swapping to a property tax or to even higher increased sales tax. So I wonder if if, there, if the state income tax is bringing in four billion dollars, where's the other money coming from? So it's a the the biggest chunk is uh, from the state sales tax. There's also some from oil and gas severance taxes, little bits from things like sin taxes and you know other things like sin that. Taxes, uh, yeah. Cigarettes and liquor. Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, so, so my point is, on a fifty billion dollar budget, isn't there you think maybe four billion dollars that can be shaved off in spending to be able to get to where Louisianians don't have to pay anything? And now they got you know another five hundred dollars, thousand dollars, five thousand dollars in their pockets yeah. each year to put back into the econ into our local economy. So, in principle, I agree with you. Here's where it comes into a, a challenge. You've talked about those thirteen thousand words in the state constitution, right? What that means is we have locked in spending. So, so of that fifty billion, when lawmakers walk in, they have discretionary authority over about ten percent of that. Uh, so this is where the problem comes in, is if you cut $4 billion right away, which, let me be clear, I'm all for. <laughs> but if you do that right away, you're, you're cutting almost all of the discretionary spending in the state that lawmakers have. And this is the other problem we have to fix in, in the budget. And this is, gets really wonky. Other states are similar. Where you walk in, we have, we have the worst, I think, though, is, so, so imagine this. You're a lawmaker 50 years ago, 
and you say, pick a program. This program is so important, I want to make sure it always gets funded. I'm going to put it in a, what we call a dedicated fund. Ooh, yes, with those lockboxes. Ooh, lots of them. <laughs> and so what happens is those, that may sound perfectly fine to the lawmakers that are there then, right? Well, okay, but what happens over time is you start to, all of the money, again, as you walk in, about 90% of the money is already spent before a lawmaker walks in. And so so making big cuts are really hard right. for lawmakers because the discretionary funds fund things like higher education, health care, things that are pretty popular with voters. Do other states have the amount of black boxes that Louisiana they had? don't. Some, there's still some in other states, but we are, so far as I can tell, the worst of any state in terms of that. And, and look, what it means is, this is, this gets back to the problems we have. You know, imagine trying to run your household budget or your small business based on spending priorities of 50 years ago or even 25 years ago. You, you couldn't respond to current priorities and current needs I mean, just on a very basic level. Think about what we spend money on today, right. a cable package, a cell phone bill, uh, exactly, internet, exactly, exactly, uh, right. you know, I don't know, what a gym membership. <laughs> you know, I, these are things our, you know, our parents or grandparents didn't think about right. spending. And, and so... Coast yeah. erosion. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's right. so, I know about erosion. <laughs> <laughs> I got a little erosion myself. So this is this is where we end up is a state that's locked into spending, and so they have a hard we have a hard time pivoting to seize opportunity or to fund priority needs. We have a we're just a very slow moving, and so we're stuck back. I don't even know from the last century, uh, perhaps the one before it. And look, we're this is. We're heading in the 100th anniversary of Huey Long's election to governor. Um, and, and we have basically, we've had three different constitutions that underscore Longism, and, and that's the, the system of government that, that really has caused all of these right. problems. All roads lead to Baton Rouge, a strong central state government, um, com complexity, right? Remember, Huey Long's goal was to punish Standard Oil. That was, okay. that was his objective yeah. in yeah. running for gov governor, right? And... Uh, here we are. <laughs> yeah. Still um, punishing still, still punishing the hand that feeds us, that, or by the hand that feeds us. It, but it almost sounds like legalized money laundering. You know, you know, we have all these we're, we're gonna spend all this, we're gonna tax it, we're gonna tax from you the rich. That's right. And the poor in this case. Yep. And we're gonna funnel it through all these little lock boxes. Yep. And you all get to spend it the way you wanna spend it. No questions asked because it's part of the constitution. Yep. It's all been legalized. That's right. You know, and now do it. But I want to get to what other bills y'all yeah. are working on. Okay, so um, you know the other things we're we're watching, obviously, uh, regulatory issues are another big one that that affects. You think about job creation. Um, we have again, we talked about this the, at the top of the show, right? Uh, executive agencies, whether it's the federal government or here at the state level, uh, that are overreaching in their uh, in their deployment of their duties, and so. Um, Representative Mark Wright has a bill that would provide some much needed oversight and reform uh, to some this super wonky, every state has it called the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, some good bedtime reading, I promise. <laughs> um, but uh, to, to bring some reform to that, to bring more sunshine to the regulatory system, and to ease the burden, particularly on small family businesses uh, that are the backbone of our economy, particularly. As he's doing all these, this, this is the licensure requirements. So this is related to that uh, as well. We, uh, we'll see on the licensure. Oh, so you're trying to shrink the, the, the administrative the part of the, the, right. the, the, the oversight committee. That's right. And by shrinking the oversight committee, it kind of makes the the other little attachments a little easier to to go knock off. Is that that's easy? right? And, and just change the process. We have far too many regulations uh, in the state, whether it's in the the licensure bucket or uh, oil and gas, or you know just just a small business or legal legal environment. Um, so so making some progress there. This is a big wonky kind of change, but one of those things that has just a big outsized impact. Uh, on the state and on 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 entrepreneurs' ability to so you to the head of the snake on this. That's one. right. It's it's the head of the dragon. <laughs> Whatever the, right. where the case may be. So are are there any other little smaller laws? I know Mark Wright's working on one. He had a couple of local state reps, I think, here in New Orleans that are, that are working on this. So where's some of the little smaller bills that you're going through over licensure requirements? Because I agree yeah. with you. When I look at all, I mean, talking with you guys, and we'll share a little bit here. You know, when you look at all the different licensure requirements Man. for all these different businesses, you know, hair braiding and, you know, and I get that you need a license to cut hair, 
you know, or be a beautician or, or you know, to color hair or whatever. But then it gets into how invasive it is that you have to have, have a certain amount of hooks oh, yeah. to hang a coat or coat hooks in your business. You know, this is where, so how do you dissect that? Yeah. I mean, like, how do you say we're going to, we're going to reduce licensure requirements and for people to cut hair, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people, the market is going to be generally uh, more, more comfortable using a business that has a licensure requirement. Yeah. Although you're fine, you're showing that many of those license requirements aren't needed because the states don't have them. It keeps other businesses from getting. So what's, yeah. So where do you draw the line, you yeah. know, between people feeling comfortable that this is being regulated by the state or, or feeling like, yeah, there's truly freedom and liberty to start a business yeah. doing the same thing, but there's no regulation on yeah. it? Yeah, it's a great question. So let's start with the problem, as you mentioned. We're one of the most, in fact, by some studies, the most onerously regulated state in the country for occupational licenses. The Institute for Justice looked at 105 low and moderate income professions and Louisiana has, requires the most number of those to have licenses, 77. And uh, so what does that mean? It's a direct impact on economic mobility. Here at the Pelican Institute, we released a report last year that showed a direct economic correlation between licensure laws and economic mobility. So what that means, we started out talking about opportunity to flourish, right? These are government demonstrably getting in the way of people pursuing the American dream. We're the only state in the country to require florists to have a license, one of only four to require interior designers to have a license. And here in Louisiana, it takes more hours of training to become an alarm installer than it does to become an EMT. These are just <laughs> out of whack. See, one's life-saving, and the other is... Providing service <laughs> for... <laughs> <in> right. <laughs> and what it means, I have a friend uh, who was trying to get an alarm installed at his house and couldn't find anybody to do it because we've, we've kept supply out uh, through these licensure rules. And really, they, you know, and I don't, they wouldn't describe it this way, and, and, but if you look at, in economic terms, these act like cartels, right? Their job is to yeah. protect incumbent businesses and keep competition out. Uh, and that's exactly what they've done. So the legislature uh, took a bold step last year in passing um, uh, Representative Amy Freeman, uh, actually my state representative, yeah. um, uh, passed a bill called the Success for Entrepreneurs Act. And what it does is it says, to, it gets to your point, it says here are the conditions that we think are appropriate for a license. If it's protecting public health, public safety, uh, welfare, or fiduciary responsibility. So the boards now are required by law to proactively say, this is why it meets one of these criteria. Okay. Um, one of the things our colleagues uh, at the Center for Justice here are doing is uh, to represent some clients who are challenging boards who have not proactively made that, uh, that argument or we believe don't meet those standards. Right. Um, and for the first time, Louisiana, uh, this is one thing we're ahead of the curve, uh, the second state in the country to allow uh, individuals to challenge these regulations um, in the court of law. So we're number two on we're something. Number two. Number two. Number two. We're going to get to number one. <laughs> um, so, so now the, the the challenge is for the legislature to say, okay, we said what the standard is, and the the, the courts are going to sort out for the regulation. But a lot of these are in statute. They passed a specific law to require a particular right. license. So now, what we'll be asking, uh, starting this year, have more heavily next year. Um, for the legislature to apply its own standard to the laws that it passed. Um, so as we evaluate things like the florist license, if we evaluate things like the interior designer's license, do they meet that standard? Is there a list someplace to go that you that you all have a list anywhere that you can go through and say here are the uh, the licensure or the are the businesses that create certain licensing yep. that we that we want to see removed? Yes. Or, or is there just a big old long list of like hundreds of them? that you got, okay, these are the ones we're going after. I'm, I'm curious. We'll be uh, presenting that report uh, soon to okay. show what the ones we believe don't meet the standard set by. Here's you know, here's a list of however many hundred, I'm right. sure there's over a hundred, oh, yes. you know, of, of, of the ones that are have licensure requirements, but we're only gonna, only gonna fight these that's right. 50, 10, 20, whatever it might be. That's right. Okay. Um, th that's exactly what we'll do. In the meantime, you can look at two places. There is a, uh, an existing report at pelicanpolicy.org. You can click on the Kevin Kane Center for Opportunity, and you'll find that report there. Uh, Kevin Kane was Pelican Institute's founder, uh, so we uh, right. honored to name our, our right. Center for Opportunity after him. 
Uh, also, the Institute for Justice, we mentioned earlier. Um, if you look up the, I believe it's ij.org, um, or just uh, search for Institute for Justice Occupational Licensing, and they have a report called License to Work, which goes state by state and shows every state and shows that particular focus on low and moderate income professions, but it ranks and grades. And this every helps, state. This stuff, not as it help individuals, and not as it promote freedom, but it, and obviously the comments is our, our economy. But this is where this fits in. Someone might have a full-time job where they get their benefits, but they still need to make a little extra money. And, 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 and like you pointed out, a lot of this is low income to moderate yeah. you know, you know, uh, families that are, you know, that they might not want to be on public assistance. Right. They might want to have their own way. And it's like I always say that the federal government, when they created the welfare system and, the, and, and all these assistance programs, they didn't create a bridge to get for people to get off of that. And what this does, it seems, is you know where there's all these licensure requirements. It keeps people locked in place. Not, but if somebody worked for somebody else and they were going to cut hair part time or braid hair part time or do flowers part time, they might finish their job, go home and eat, and work for a few hours, and now they're prospering. That's right. Now their freedoms are being you know now they're being exercise their own freedom. And the, the free market's prospering, and capitalism is prospering, and everybody flourishes in this right. in this environment. That's exactly you know, right. it, it, everybody wins uh, yeah, at the end. Of exactly, the day. and and actually the boards win too because they have more members. You know, people the more people in the profession who can join because they their say, membership I can, you know, you're you're not going to regulate me as much, so I'm going to join yeah. your organization. Everybody wins. Exactly. Exactly. I like really this. Yeah. And, and this this builds a bridge uh, as well to, to sort of the other area, and then I'll I'll start with sort of what we're working on big picture, and and touch a couple things in this legislative session. So you hit this nail on the head with our social safety net systems. We have uh, not only not built bridges for people to get out of it we have really built uh, snare nets for people to get trapped in. Um, so of the things we know matter most to help people get out of poverty, which is quality work and family formation, two of the most important things, uh, education being the third, uh, actually both of those are disincentivized in our social safety net system. If you make more money, you lose dramatically more benefits. Right. If you marry, you lose dramatically more benefits. And so we've taken on a project along with colleagues at the Texas Public Policy Foundation and the Georgia Center for Opportunity. We've launched a project we call the Alliance for Opportunity um, that is focused on social safety net reform. And this is a big multi-year, multi-state project um, to, to make better sense of, of our safety net programs and to, to bring them together to point them toward meaningful work. We just know the impact that has on an individual. So here in Louisiana, uh, a couple of things will happen this year. Uh, Representative Barbara Freiberg is bringing uh, a, a bill and a couple of resolutions relating to auditing the application of these social safety net programs in Louisiana. So we've looked at TANF, which means Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, um, SNAP, which is Food Stamps, um, and WIOA, which is a, a workforce uh, program. Uh, are those, the legislative auditor has, has completed audits on that, uh, and now uh, Representative Freiberg is working with them to, to do a more comprehensive audit in Louisiana of our social safety net system. And our goal is to better understand the way it works today so that we can bring some meaningful reforms. Our goal is that if you enter the safety net, if you're whatever, whatever your entry point is, that you have one case manager that helps navigate the entire system. So that streamlines and brings efficiency into the system, but it also means we could combine programs like workforce and food stamps together to say, hey, let's let's do a, uh, this is what they do in Utah, it's actually the only state in the country right now by federal law who's allowed to do this, that we're working on changing that really? too. Um, they've combined all of those programs into one, they call it Department of Workforce Services. Um, mm -hmm. And so when you, whatever you're entering into the safety net, um, they're going to help you screen you for work experience and training and certifications. They're going to match you up to say, you know, there's this program at the community college or over here to get extra credentials or whatever that help you get a better job. Um, they're going to help work you through the system so that you get the benefits that, that you've, you know, you're entitled to by law, but that they're pointing toward work. Right. That these are seen as workforce supports and. You know, a colleague of mine says this well, that we've made poverty in America survivable, but not escapable. And Louisiana, so you imagine a Louisiana in a few years that 
has made uh, significant progress on opportunity, particularly for mm -hmm. our lowest income uh, friends and family around the state by removing occupational licensure laws, right-sizing our safety yeah. programs. At the same time, we're reforming the education system and changing the tax code to bring more jobs and opportunity. You can just see right now, this is a, a, a state that, that could right. be flourishing exactly. in a major way um, and could light reform for the rest of the, the, rest of the country. Right. Um, and that's why I'm optimistic. That's why I do I love this it. I love uh, it. every day. But, you know, so we'll be watching the legislature and looking not only at the bills as they move through the process. It's an election year. It's hard right. to get big things done. Yeah, it's an election um, so yeah, my, my. <laughs> but They'll set up the debate that's going to come this fall. Um, and these are the questions we, we need to start asking the people asking for it. our votes. I love right? it. Where do you stand on these? Yeah, so I love it. That's, that's what we're working on. This I, love it. I love this. But I love the whole, I love the, I really like the fact that you're doing this uh, pro, or what to do this program like Utah that links everything together yeah. because it all comes down to work ethic. Which, by the way, I did a podcast a couple, a few months, a couple months, I watched about a month ago on work ethic, and I tie it to government programs and I talk about how you know government doesn't like a good work ethic yeah. because government when you have a good work ethic, government you don't need government assistance. Yeah. And, it, and when you have a good work ethic and you tie that to family and you tie that to the community, a good work ethic gets everybody out of poverty and off the government system, which doesn't have bridges to get you off. And, and the whole thing about, you know, create your, you can't make a certain amount of money, you can't have a father in the home, but when you change the laws and you connect them to opportunity, less licensure requirements, it's got to be part of a package right. and not just, oh, we're going to throw this bill who knows the unintended consequences are going to be 10 years from now, but we're going to create this bill and that bill on, on it. Yeah, that's right. You know, we have this patchwork quilt of programs. We don't have a system in this country. Right. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I'll, I'll, I'll point out to this, maybe we can talk more about it even on another episode, but uh, the Brookings Institution, which is by no means a, you know, vast right-wing, <laughs> right, this is a center-left organization, um, did this big longitudinal study of poverty. And they came out with something they call the success sequence. And what they found is that individuals who follow this pattern, only 2% of them end up in poverty. It's astounding research. That's, that's staggering. They, they continue to test. There's three steps to it. The first is graduate from high school. The second is get a job. And the third is marry before children. And for individuals who follow that pattern, only 2% end up in poverty. And you know this is not a moral argument. This is not a you know whatever. This right. is this is pure data. And imagine if they taught this in high school, right? Oh imagine gosh, that's horrible. Even if kids <laughs> knew, right? I'm joking, of that's course. Right. But I mean, that's you know. And again, it's you're not moralizing on what yeah. marriage means or doesn't mean. You know, that all those set that aside. That is not what's at, at stake, right? It's if you graduate high school, then get a job, and then have a have a marriage before children. You have a you have a ninety eight percent chance of succeeding, or at least not being in in. Well, you take the moral argument out of it. You know, when you have a child out of wedlock, it's usually because it's not planned. It's usually because you, you're at a point in your life, and I'm not overgeneralizing, but just statistically, you know, yeah. talk speaking here, you know, it it, it ends up happening at a time when it's not planned, and if that's not planned, other things in life might not be planned. So you're right; it's just a snowball effect. Yeah. You know, but when you planned everything a little bit more, so it's teaching children how to plan a little bit better. But it's but that's a three step process that makes it very simple. Yep. Anything else, Pelicans working on this this session? Gosh, um, we have to go in detail on yeah, it. No. I mean, is, it like, like a, is there like a checklist? Boop, 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 boop. We'll, we'll be watching some legal reform. We'll be watching insurance reform. Uh, we'll be watching certainly budget conversations um, with all of this money flowing in. Can we constrain the growth of government and ensure? Uh, that we set ourselves up for success in the future. So we'll be watching all of those things and, and commenting on them, and gosh, it's going to be an interesting uh, couple of months. <laughs> yes, it really is. I'll ask you one last yep. question. I always talk about freedom being under attack in America. Now, we've talked about freedom this whole interview, yeah. and we've talked about it, and, and maybe you have said it, but I'm going to ask you the question to point it out and kind of shine the light on yeah. it. Where do you think freedom is most under attack in America? Oh man, it feels like uh, a lot of places right now. But I, you know, I really think it's it goes back to where we started. It's a a government that sometimes well intentioned, other times not, 
is so overstepping into lives of individual Americans that we stand in the way of opportunity. We make it harder for people to pursue the American dream. And whether that is uh, you know, overreach we see now into the banking and energy sector mm -hmm. at the federal level, whether it is, um, again, unelected bureaucrats stepping in to make laws and usurping the power of a legislative mm -hmm. body, um, or whether it's things like occupational licensure where appointed boards are, are preventing individuals very directly from getting work. Um, our freedom is under threat from a government that's trying to do far too much and frankly not following the rules. And it's up to us as citizens to get it back in line, whether that's yeah. through the courts, through activism, through voting the right people into office. Um, we've got to, it's, it's time for some pretty bold action. I think that's where freedom is most under threat. I, th I think we exercise that freedom to do some of these things you're talking about. We're going to have more freedom in the end. No question about it. Daniel, you're amazing. Thank you appreciate so much. It. I really yeah. appreciate it. And thank you for the time. We'll do an update by, at the end of the session right. to, so you can have a little scorecard <laughs> on how we did. Everybody, please, thank you for listening. And uh, please share the interview, share the video, share the podcast. Uh, check out the Pelican Institute for Public Policy. And uh, what's your website again? Pelicanpolicy.org. And visit my site, williamwallace.net. Thank you so much and have a great day.